that's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Lady in the Dale, a four-episode miniseries directed by Zachary Drucker and Nick Camilleri, uh, which will uh, premiere January 31st, 2021 on HBO uh, and will subsequently be available on HBO Max. Uh, on that first Sunday, the first two episodes will screen back to back, and then the next two episodes will be uh, in the subsequent Sundays after. <laughs> this docu series was excellent. Yes, I agree. Okay, I'm gonna try to tell the basic story. This documentary revolves around a woman named Geraldine Elizabeth Carmichael. Mm -hmm. She became notable for starting the 20th Century Motor Car Co Corp, mm -hmm. named after that business in Atlas Shrugged. By Ayn Rand, yes. And her business uh, created a car called the Dale, mm -hmm. which was a three-wheeled car. Which she bought the... Uh... She worked in... Yeah, we'll get into that, but she bought the rights to this car and then whatever. Okay, so... She was in development of this car and sold options, mm -hmm. which she then like mismanaged the money and was uh, charged with securities fraud. Mm -hmm. So like a basic white collar crime. Mm -hmm. But what makes Geraldine Elizabeth Carmichael even more remarkable is that she was born Jerry Michael. Mm -hmm. So Elizabeth uh, is a trans woman. But what even makes her story more crazy is back in the day, Jerry, uh, Jerry transitioned when he was around, like in his 40s. Mm -hmm. So for 40 plus years, Jerry was a grade A con artist, a la uh, Catch Me If You Can. Sure, not quite at that level, but... Not at the level of what he was in perpetu uh, perpetrating, but like just all over the country running at all times. Mm -hmm. During that period, Jerry had five children with a woman named Elizabeth, his wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, Vivian, his wife. Um, in the first episode they go over, there were children pre this relationship. Yeah, he has more than the five children we see, but we focus on the five. And two of the children, Candy and Michael Michael... Uh, are featured heavily uh, sort of talking about their grandmother, mother and grandmother, along with uh, one of Elizabeth's granddaughters. Correct. Ah, oh, just riveting, riveting. So the four <clears throat> episodes, episode one basically recounts the story of Jerry and mm -hmm. all the nonsense he was up to up until he transitions. Episode two is Elizabeth starting 20th Century Motor Corp. And the development of the Dale. Episode three is the trial associated with her securities fraud situation. And episode four is her life after ultimately serving time in prison and uh, like yeah, up to her death. Round, roundabout, yeah. Roundabout, yeah. <laughs> oh, this was so good. Yeah. It's just like, it's so involved. The so, There's so many conversation points. It's so layered. But this woman's actual story is fascinating. Uh, she is, I, I think, a perfect subject for this kind of format Yes. Uh, as well because it, it has to contextualize uh, her life prior to being Liz uh, and also attitudes towards gender and trans people and how, while she can't entirely be classified as like a role model per se, uh, she's a very important figure uh, in trans representation. Also, the fact that this woman was taking on the big three in Detroit, yeah. so GM, Ford, and Chrysler, is, I mean, just that alone is remarkable. And her bravado... Oh, yeah, she was tenacious. ...is uh, really, uh, I, I would say, inspiring. The, the tenacity and the resiliency uh, of Liz Carmichael is... My personal favorite is episode three, because that's with the courtroom uh, oh, stuff. Oh, well, and getting back to you saying that this is the perfect subject, there's so much news footage. There, there's just so much to work with. And there's so much I like about it. My, I, can't, I don't even know what my favorite part is, but uh, a device that's used heavily are these, like, they're not cartoons. How would you refer to them? There's a large amount of people working on the animation that went into this. Animation. Story. So basically, we're taking... They're, they're taking photos of, you know, said people and uh, transposing them onto, like, cartoon figures that move kind of like stick figures, mm -hmm. which normally I don't like that kind of thing, but this is done 
so well. There was a lot of nuance that also... It, it, it was complex because those animations also reflected like mood and tone mm -hmm. uh, I found quite effectively. They're also kind of funny in the way like a lot of these TikTok videos of like people putting eyes on inanimate objects and talking. So not only is it very layered, but it's kind of funny. It's kind of funny. It's so well done that I said I would watch, like I would have watched this entire docuseries with only the use of that animation and probably been okay with it. Sure, but then, I, you know, I did, but, but there is so much footage. I did find Liz transfixing in, oh, she's, yeah. in the news footage uh, of the 70s. Oh, yeah. And that one uh, poster of her where she's standing kind of like Wonder Woman over Los Angeles. Uh, I mean, it's... Okay, incredible. there's a lot to get to, not a lot of time. So, do you want to start? You, why don't you start with your notes? So, one of Liz's daughter's candy is the main narrator. Sure. And I just really liked her. Yeah, she's riveting too. She has a great personality. Something that's also very telling about Liz Carmichael is her two children... Candy and Michael and her granddaughter speak very fondly of her and her two children they recount like being on the run mm -hmm. constantly on the lam having to bounce from one place to the other never really having stability but they both felt like they had a great childhood and that their mom also oh my goodness also like these children had to participate in Jerry's transition to Liz mm -hmm. so they would practice like calling her mom in public it was a very sort of like sophisticated and from, you know, what we see, I think a very um, elegant approach mm -hmm. to this transition. Also like Vivian, Liz, Jerry's wife. I mean, it's, it's sad that both Liz and Vivian are gone because yeah. Vivian would have also been interesting to hear from firsthand. Because she was very accepting of Liz. Well, and I think it's important the first episode goes into how Vivian came to be with Jerry. Yes. Who basically rescued her. Uh, but also a, a key figure is uh, Vivian's brother, Charles Richard Barrett, and kind of the allegiance yes. and affinity he had for Liz, uh, which is also fascinating and very touching. Like Yeah, Charles is... Um, he says something about how he knew... Like, when he met Liz for the first time, he knew that it was real and knew that, like, Liz was a woman and he could feel it and he could see her kindness and... I thought that was very moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So just going down the list of all the things. So one of the things Jerry used to get into and what got him into the most trouble was <laughs> this fool was printing counterfeit money. Yeah, he did that. <laughs> and he ended up getting charged, but then he like ditched out like when he was about to be sentenced or go on trial. Because Liz also ran right before a sentencing for her securities fraud. So this bitch has run from jail more than once um but there's an important distinction distinction between those two periods that we can get into yes right um so a the candy talks about liz's daughter talks about how they communicated when they were on the run mm -hmm. and i thought it was really fascinating that they used um like ads in like a very like in a particular um, newspaper, mm -hmm. they would place like these coded ads, mm -hmm. and that's how family and friends would know where they are and where to yeah. what a rendezvous. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. At, at one point, one of these awful journalists who we'll name later um, describes Jerry Jerry's life prior to being Liz as that of uh, like a a B uh, crime movie. But I thought uh, Liz is a fascinating subject worthy of Jim Thompson. Like th this was. She, lived like she a, successfully pulled a lot of stunts. She lived a film noir life. Yes. Uh, Liz, well, Jerry was uh, enamored by Elizabeth Taylor. Mm -hmm. And that's where her name came from. Um, ugh. So then there is a woman named, is it Susan Stryker? Mm -hmm. And a she... A historian. She's like a, a historian, like a trans historian. Mm -hmm. She talks about how during, because Liz had to transition like in the 70s and early 80s and talks about um, how that worked. And they mentioned something called, uh, was it the Tijuana? The Tijuana two-step. The Tijuana two-step. How a lot of trans women couldn't get sex reassignment surgery because doctors would use the excuse they didn't want to sterilize these men like it was unethical <clears throat> so these trans women would go down to mexico tijuana and, ha and be castrated mm -hmm. so that when they came back to the u.s they'd be like well i'm already sterile so 
you know, finish, do, what you, finish the do what I need you to do. And also they would make a trans woman get divorced uh, as well. Yes. But um, Liz, Jerry at the time, no, Liz, Liz had a, like a, a fish store. Oh yeah, there was a, there <laughs> She's had so many businesses. That were actually very successful. That were genius. successful. But she had a, like she was um, distributing like exotic fish. And, and through them. that, she was able to get hormones mm -hmm. through veterinarians. But she learned, she, she couldn't get hormones from a doctor. So she learned through breeding these fish. Like what, like what kind of, like what hormones did and then was getting, that was fascinating. Mm -hmm. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, getting back to Liz's wife, Vivian, um, Candy talks about how Vivian initially helped Liz, like with her hair and makeup and clothes. Mm -hmm. So it seems like they had a very loving relationship. And we also get to hear, so Liz recorded herself a lot. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of audio with Liz talking about herself and she talks about like how she and Vivian had a very loving, almost like sister-like relationship. And when she first transitioned, she would, when she would venture out in public with the children, they would pretend that they were like sister, like, like sisters. Yeah, they would go out to bars and nightclubs and they would, they would pretend to be sisters. And then later on, such as uh, where Liz was uh, heading up 20th century motor, uh, she... Vivian worked there, but uh, under the guise of her secretary. Yes. G getting back to Liz being a con artist uh, and all her tape recordings, there's one point where she's talking to a reporter. Oh, God, I know what you're and, about, yeah. and she says, the two most important things about me is that I have endless energy and, I, and I'm totally 100% honest. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. But Because, yeah, she's a straight-up con artist. She is, but, but I think that... She, her intentions for the Dale were um, not malicious. She wasn't trying to defraud. Uh, truly, I don't really believe that. I think she really did want this to work. It's just that she was a fake it till you make it type. Um, I agree. And I, I think that once she was living in the skin she wanted to be in, in, in as Liz, I, I think that even the family reflects on this was a time where there was stability. Uh, because she wasn't trying to be a con artist anymore. She was trying to be a, a businesswoman. But uh, to piggyback off <laughs> that, Liz does say numerous times that basically all she cares about is money. She sure. doesn't care about the environment. Oh, so another thing we didn't bring up is the attention around the Dale, you know, was sort of... Liz is a charismatic person and a woman trying to develop a, like, like, like a brand new automotive brand obviously is like a huge endeavor. But what really sparked the attention, attention for the deal was, you know, there was the gas crisis back in the 70s. Uh, and most cars were getting like 8 to 10 miles per gallon. But the Dale, she claimed, could get 70 miles per mm -hmm. gallon. So that's important because she also talks about how she didn't care about the environment. She doesn't care about anything except being very rich and successful. Mm -hmm. So, you know... I, uh, yeah, take that as it will. I, I think Susan Stryker says it best, um, as in we can't really view Liz Carmichael as a, a role model per se, but she's a survivor. And that while we're so hungry to see trans and, you know, other gay representations of role models and heroes, you know, in many cases we have to take what we can get. And yes. just because somebody doesn't make all the right choices doesn't mean they can't be a role model either, I think. Because um, there's really a lot about Liz to appreciate and uh, hold up. Yeah. Uh, more craziness. Uh, it's clear that the mob or some sort of mafia entity was involved in 20th Century Motor Car Corp. So that's like a plot line. Well, there's like a murder. I think we didn't real also notate that she was able to transition because they staged Jerry's death. That's right. Because, because there was some mob involved. Jerry was like, something about like firearms to Cuba, some, something crazy that Jerry was involved in. So then Jerry staged his death. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that allowed for, I think that was, you know, Jerry was always trans, uh, but I think that situation allowed for Liz to feel safe to come out. Mm -hmm. Um, Liz also says that she intended to run for president. 
Which she, I think she could have. She said, if I can stay out of jail, I intend to run for president. <laughs> Which is where I wrote, also wrote down, Joe Exotic. Uh, yeah, she, so many good quotes. Like, she's just so audacious and Oh, I love confident. When, when she <laughs> is being interviewed by reporters for uh, whether she wants to go to a men's, women, or, or prisons, or women's prison, and is, she basically said it doesn't matter because she's not afraid to be anywhere. Yeah. Like... <laughs> okay, so there is a reporter, Dick Carlson, who's featured heavily um, in this docuseries. He happens to be the father of Tucker Carlson. Mm -hmm. Dick Carlson, all we can say based on what we see in the documentary is he's transphobic for sure. Oh, for sure, yeah. But based on his son, who's transphobic, homophobic, I would say clearly racist, mm -hmm. um, the apple did not fall far from the tree, but... Um, it is this reporter, Dick Carlson, who starts to... F I mean, he says he wasn't fixated on Liz, but he is clearly fixated. And he even says early on that when he... Or he says at a point, like when he first met her to interview her, he thought something was funny when he shook her hand and saw her, because she's a big lady, that he thought she was a man, but couldn't say that. Mm -hmm. Which I think is so weird, because you all you did was, after the fact, when it was speculated that she may have been born Jerry Michael. You had no problem calling this woman a he, she, and all these crazy things. So I think it's funny that he said at the time he couldn't mention to anyone he thought she was a man. But he is on a witch hunt for her. Yep. And it's complicated because as an investigative reporter, obviously he saw, saw something that wasn't right with the business dealings. But I think because he has a clear hatred for um, what he saw in Liz... He just pursued her relentlessly. Yes, uh, what I think they even say that he did. They did twenty-seven stories on twenty-century motor court, and it's like uh, it, it was it that was harassment. Well, I but think. again, that's how the news cycle works. Whatever people are going to buy into, that's what you put out. So it's not like he was just telling a story no one cared about. No, but he was like a dog with a bone. He was, For he sure, was he's trash. Because if Liz had been Jerry, nobody would have batted an eye. I agree. Um, um, but I brought that up because the, it is Dick Carlson's reporting that really shined this negative light on her, you know, questionable business dealings. And there was a lot of heat on her because she was in the state of California, like she was in the like Canoga Park or something. So then she moved her operations to Texas. Mm -hmm. But then when she got to Texas, they were like, we don't play that game. Like clearly your, your business affairs are not in order. There's fraud. So then she goes to trial. Mm -hmm. Um... And the trial is riveting. Mm -hmm. um, Liz decides to represent herself because she feels like the public defender is in cahoots with the just, uh, with the district attorney's office. Mm -hmm. So how am I going to get a fair trial? And she spent her time uh, in prison awaiting awaiting trial, learning while she was law. in jail. Yeah, she studied law, so she's like, I can defend myself, and she does an effective job. Yeah. Spoiler alert: she does not win her case, but. Part of the reason why she doesn't, which is another really interesting part of the story, is one of the... So, of the 12 jurors, 11 were like, this bitch is guilty. But well, one lady <laughs> named Mary kept saying she wasn't guilty. And then we find out... Mary was given a frick. <laughs> that someone on Liz's team gave Mary a mink coat, mm -hmm. so she had been bribed. So there was heat on her... Then Mary got sick, and then there was some weird they stuff. They replaced her. They replaced her, but in like an illegal way. They kind of... They like uh, forged like medical... Like the, the prosecution forged some medical records to get... To influence the judge to remove this jury member. And once they got a new juror, they all said she was... They bamboozled it, yeah. Um, so this is 1980? In two of 70... The trial was in 76. Right, right, right. I think. And it lasted a, like almost a year, like nine months. Um, two of the jurors that we speak to, a black woman and a white woman, both sound equally problematic in how yes. they're talking about her. Uh, so as valiant as her efforts were, she didn't uh, stand a she chance. Didn't, she didn't stand a chance. Uh, but um, and I, another fascinating thing was they tried to uh, finagle some snitch to come say that uh, she had put a, right. a hit out on the DA. But when the snitch found out that Liz would be representing herself because she had to be in closed quarters to hear all this. And she um, would be cross-examining him. Cross -exam the, the, he got scared and like... Which I found... That's fascinating. Yeah. There's so many things. Also, um, when Liz... Okay, so then Liz is found guilty. 
And while she... Did I burp? Is that what you left at? <laughs> oh. I'm human. Yes, you are. I may not seem like it, but I am. Um, right before Liz is sentencing, she takes her family and they're on the lam again. Mm -hmm. Liz effectively evades the police for like not eight or nine years. Mm -hmm. And during that time starts another business. <laughs> she starts a floral, like a floral, she has like a floral business where she takes like um, homeless people, undocumented immigrants, people who are not being paid, who people who uh, she can pay under the table to sell like f flowers on the corner. And she does this in Texas. She's successful until another reporter. Yes. Did you bring up Unsolved Mysteries? Oh, shit. That's yeah. how she gets caught and goes to jail because... That's also super interesting. So, yes. Yeah, so, uh, she ends up getting caught because uh, there's a, an episode of Unsolved Mysteries about her. And people call immediately and say, like, yeah, <laughs> I, there's this lady who runs, like, a floral business. and I think I know who that bitch is. I think I know who that bitch is. Is that from Pineapple Express? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, but um, she, uh, so then she goes to prison for like 18 months. Mm -hmm. And while she's in prison, like... Uh, falls off her bunk. Hurts herself. Hurts herself. Yeah. Um, but then the final episode is her life after she gets out of prison, which is made more difficult because there is a reporter. And this is like the year 2000 now. Mm -hmm. And a reporter new to the area where she is in Texas notices like all these people selling flowers on the corner like and wants to do a report on it and then starts pulling out that string. starts pulling on that string and then they're like oh my god do you know who this lady is she did the dale thing back in the day so then now now this person is also fixated on her and he's also misgendering her like clearly no respect for this lady um, I'm just surprised I, that that's at the level of hatred we're at here, though. It's just no, well, definitely for Dick Carlson, he was proud to say call, like misgender her and say that he did not accept her. Oh yeah, Dick Carlson, the other guy who's aged as well as Gerard Depardieu. Ugh. Um, um, although not as proud. And remind well, not no, uh, but and, but reminded me of that. Sort Gerard of, seems like a nice man. Yeah, I think <laughs> Gerard probably mostly. He'd be fun to hang. He doesn't out. want to pay taxes, but. Uh, uh, Dale uh, Carlson is kind of of that ilk of like Bobby Riggs, just a fucking chauvinist. Dick Carlson. Yeah. Yeah. So then you said Dale, I think. But the the reporter in Texas, he's not as venomous uh, and malicious as Dick, but clearly like... He describes Liz like a freak show. Yes. Like, so, I mean... You could tell she had a five o'clock shadow and breasts or what I call breasts. You know, just like clearly extremely offensive. Yeah. That same kind of fascination with the uh, the body parts of trans people that really uh, he brought a lot of heat on her which started to create problems so prior to him she was kind of left alone but then with his reporting now all of a sudden the city was like imposing like citations on her and made things difficult Liz got sick she had several she had like lung cancer and skin cancer and she had broken a hip and so she was not well. Ultimately, she dies. One quote she says, though, um, or provides, Liz, she says, if you have enough self-esteem, you don't need God. I wrote that down, too. I really like that. that. And I'm not, Loved it. you know, I'm not a religious person. I'm not shitting on religion. Oh, yeah, but, not at all. But um, I just thought, like, it was just such a powerful quote from someone who lived their life so boldly, mm -hmm. um, which gets me to my last note that Susan Stryker, she also made reference to the idea that you did earlier Liz is not a role model per se, but she is a survivor. Mm -hmm. And I just found her to be so interesting. And I do think she's problematic. Like Sure, but not like a Joe Exotic problematic. No, but you know, I, I think we often just automatically, you know, because trans people are lumped into LGBT, we assume that trans people um, share similar, but not all trans people identify as queer or support, of course, um, like equality sometimes. And Liz was like a libertarian. She's very anti-government. So she didn't pay taxes. So we don't know what her views were. We don't get any mention from anyone about her views on like homosexuality. No, and, but... And we don't hear any mention of her romantic life outside of when Jerry married Vivian. So, you know, I don't want to like iconicize Geraldine Elizabeth Carmichael because 
I don't know what her actual views were, but I do think as a trans woman to like do what she did in spite of all the, in spite of the well, laws, yeah. the laws that she broke, but also sure, of course society pushing laws. back against her, I think is very impressive and inspiring. I agree. There's, uh, you know, I also have, I wrote down Elizabeth Holmes because I saw a lot of similarities. Oh, the inventor. Say a lot of simili- similarities there with a, the, is it Theranos? I always forget that. Theranos is the machine yeah. she, Elizabeth it, Holmes. As if like, Elizabeth Holmes in a Captain Fantastic kind of family environment of uh, con artists and drifters, and but also where there's like there's a lot of love and empathy mm-hmm. uh, on display as well. And I, I, this documentary is produced by the Duplass brothers. The Duplass brothers, who did you know, who have uh, writers, directors, you've seen in tons of stuff. Notably, they also produced uh, the or Wild Wild Country, which also was fascinating. Wow. What's that one about? With uh, Oshu, the... Oh, yes. That Sheila. Was, yeah, Sheila. <laughs> that, I recommend that docuseries. Yeah. Didn't one of the Duplass brothers do a movie where he's, like, going to have gay sex for money? Or oh, Hump Day. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's a Liz Shelton film. Rest in peace, she died. I could rewatch that, actually. Uh, yes, Hump Day's good. Uh, you know, and uh, there's four composers that worked on this. Two of them, Danny Benstein, Saunders, Jurians, and sorry if I keep... If I'm butchering their names, are quickly becoming some of my favorite composers. They did the score for White Tiger uh, okay. and uh, Ozark. Uh, I loved the score. I loved the look uh, and all the animation. Um, besides Stryker, I think Mia Yamamoto was... Uh, oh, yes. There's a lawyer who talks about sort of the... She sort of outlines or breaks down in lay terms the legal troubles Liz had. <laughs> but yeah, I liked her a lot I liked too. her presence a lot. Um, Zachary Drucker, who's one of the co-directors, a producer on Transparent, is a, a notably a trans artist as well. Um, I thought Liz looked, in her 70s period, kind of looked Agnes Moorhead-y. Yeah, like... Wait, uh, but in a good Indora way. From yeah, Indora. Wish. But I, I, I loved her look. I thought she looked yeah. great. Yeah, you have like one minute left. Before... The camera stops? I, I don't know. I... It's... It's... It's important representation, but also, you know, we have, yeah, of course we can't lionize her, but that doesn't mean that we don't need to see her story. Yeah, great work. Everyone yeah. involved. I would give this documentary four out of five stars. I uh, second that, yes. Four out of five. Bye. Bye. Bye.